So once we have a problem, once we have a concrete demonstrable thing that we're concerned about and we're able to authorize deviation, what's the next step? We feel the next step is to think through what's the design space? What do we mean by the design space? By the design space we mean what do the characteristics of different solutions look like in such a way that we can predefine what we are going to try out and iterate and adapt over. So we might start with uh, school, an example from schooling. We might look at the situation and say, our children are not coming to grade three with sufficiently mastery of fluency in literacy and reading. So we set a concrete, we have a problem. Problem is the kids don't read well enough to read fluently enough that they can read and retain other content and without that the foundations for the rest of their schooling is jeopardized. So we want to solve that problem. That's now a kind of problem you can think about solving. Now what will immediately happen, people will rush in with names of things they might try out. Well we need teacher training. Great. What is teacher training though? It's a name of a class of things you might try. It's not the name of a concrete thing that I could actually try. So we might say what's the design space of teacher training as a way of remedying child low reading capability. So we say, okay, fine. We want to think about a class of possible ways of addressing our problem with teacher training. But then we want to think through, well, what would the teacher training look like? And I'm just going to illustrate how complex and nuanced and granular the design space of actual solutions is by illustrating teacher training. Well, first, we'd have to think what's going to be taught. We can imagine that teacher training could consist of primarily transmitting to teachers content. That is, we're teaching them that content that they need to master in order to convey it. Or we could primarily be about pedagogical method. We're going to we assume they have the content, and we're going to primarily be about equipping teachers with methods of conveying that content. So already we have teacher training, but we have this decision on one dimension of the design space, the what dimension. The, but there's a second dimension of the design space, which is how. How are we going to convey this content to teachers? We could have <coughs> class-based teaching where we bring the teachers to some location and we teach them in a classroom setting. Or we could have um, active learning where the training goes to the teacher's classroom environment. So already we have two different ways in which we could either transmit method with active learning or transmit method content with active learning. We could transmit method with class-based teaching. We could transfer so we, now we have, instead of thinking about teacher training as what we're doing, we're thinking about the design space of teacher training. Now already there's four conceptually very different projects or ways to go about teacher training, and we're only beginning. Because then we could ask ourselves the question, where? Right? We could do, we could gather teachers from a large array of places and put them in one central site to help train them. Or we can imagine distributing the training across large numbers of sites. The advantage, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both. If we concentrate, then we can think we can get the pedagogy the best because we have relatively few trainers. If we diffuse it, we have to have large numbers of agents. So now we can imagine not just four, but now we have eight possible ways of doing teacher training. And you see where the combinatorics of this spiral to where if you think through the design space, you realize, Oh, in order to have something to do to solve this problem, I have to get into the granularity of it and think carefully through which of these options is going to work in a way that I'm prepared to iterate and adapt with respect to different options.